Great. Um, yeah, I'm Dr. Louise Brown. Um, I just thought the first off, I'll, I'll give you a bit of background about myself. Um, my background is actually a mechanical engineer. This picture on the top left is a very old picture of me in a week when I was learning to weld um, with some dignitary. I don't know who he was, but um, yeah, so I started off doing a degree in mechanical engineering. And I'm old enough that the first time I met a computer was when I was actually doing that degree um, and realized that I actually loved writing software. And so I then did a PhD in the composites group um, and designed and built this machine for filament winding of composite materials, making this sort of um, shaped um, wound objects. Um, and after that, I've, I've had various um, software engineering jobs. Um, firstly, in the computer science department at, um, at Nottingham, um, creating um, software for automatically converting scanned images into um, CAD um, files for t embroidery machines. So the sort of stuff that I've got on my shirt today. Um, and then my daughter was very ill when she was born. So I actually um, worked from home for 13 years. So uh, this year has been a bit of a blast from the past, really, sort of uh, going back to where I was working for a long time. One of the jobs I had was um, writing software for home crafts, so bobbin lace, like the picture that you can see in the bottom left, right here. And then about 10 years ago, um, I basically did full circle and went back to the composites research group at Nottingham, working on the TextGen project, um, which I will tell you about now. So this is just this is the uh, the home web page for the TextGen project. Um, it's open source software. It's been completely developed at, at Nottingham and within the Composites Research Group. And it's what we call a preprocessor, which is used to model the geometry of textile structures. Mainly we use it for composite materials, but it can be used for other types of textiles like you can see on the, on the right hand side here. So I thought I'd just give a bit of background in case you don't know what composite materials are. So basically a composite material is one that's composed of at least two materials um, and they combine to give properties which are superior to those of the in individual constituents. So a sort of classic one that you see um, every day is reinforced concrete. That's essentially a composite material. But what we talk about um, in our group are fibre reinforced polymer composites. So they're things like fiberglass, carbon fibre and Kevlar. And basically we have these fibres which are embedded in a polymer matrix. And this diagram is slightly misleading because say in a typical um, toe of carbon fibres, you might have 12,000 fibres within, within that toe. They're extremely fine. And typically they're used for sort of fairly high end, particularly carbon fibre is used for fairly high end applications, things like planes, racing cars. Um, the Dreamliner that you can see there is 50% composite materials. And they're used because they've got high stiffness to, and strength to weight ratios. Um, so they're they're light, but extremely stiff and strong. Um, and um, we're talking about textile composites. I don't know if, if you've ever seen um, a, a racing car and you look at it close up. When you look at the black here, you'll probably see that it's got um, a woven structure. And so textile composites are things like this. So this on the top left is um, woven carbon fiber, and they're they're used in that format because um, they're, they're easy to, to handle and um, sometimes you can, you can um, adjust the properties of the material by the woven structure. And typically they're in this sort of woven format and then they're laminated to form a composite. And more recently, we've gone into more exotic 3D woven textiles like the one on the on the right here. This is actually a micro CT scan of, um, of an actual carbon fiber um, textile. And the thing about this is that because essentially when you combine a different woven structure and a different resin polymer, you essentially create a new material. And so you need to know what the properties of that are. And because we've got these different woven structures with fibers going in different directions, um, you don't necessarily know what the properties are going to be in each direction. So if you have a block of steel and you pull it in any of the any direction, it's 
strength is going to be the same in each direction. But with something like, like this, where you've got fibers going in different directions, the strength is going to be different or the stiffness is going to be different in the different directions. So somehow we need to predict what those properties are going to be. Obviously you can, you can make them and test them, um, but for a, particularly for a 3D woven fabric like this one, it might take a month to um, to string up the to warp up the the weaving loom. So if you can predict the properties, then that's all the better. So that's where TextGen comes in. So TextGen is um, uh, open source software. Um, if you just download it, you'll and run it up, you get something like this um, on the top left here, which um, there's a user interface and. Basically, the, the structure of the thing is so that if you can specify a center line and a cross section of this along that center line, then you can specify a yarn and um, create different um, assemblies of those yarns. But there are um, wizards which automatically create different types of standard materials. So a 2D um, fabric like this one or for the 3D different um, types of 3D textiles, we've got automatic methods of creating those as well. So um, you can create these textiles and then what you do is, what we do is we mesh them. So we've generated a model, we mesh it, and then we can use that to predict material properties. So typically we use finite element analysis to predict um, mechanical properties, how stiff a material is and how strong it is or um, computational fluid dynamics, because if we've created a textile, when you're actually creating the comp composite materials, you then infuse it with resin. So you want to know how the resin is going to flow through the material so that when you've put it in a mold, you know where to put the inlet so that you get it completely infused and um, don't get dry spots. Because of the nature of the material, this is what we call, the text is what we call meso scale. Um, but because we model the yarns as essentially a solid um, with properties of each element output with um, orientations and um, volume fractions, we use microscale um, analysis first to feed the um, properties of um, different fiber um, packing into the into the model. So um, if we've got 12,000 um, fibers set in resin, if they're squeezed tighter, then the material proper, then the properties of that will be different to if they're more widely spread. And we feed those properties into the MESA scale model. And then we do the simulations there to get um, properties, say, of, of the stiffness in the different directions and we feed that into a macro scale model where we can do large scale um, modeling of bigger components, because basically it would be far too um, computationally intensive to be able to model at this meter scale on a large scale model. So that's what TextGen is doing. So some of the sort of just a couple of examples of, of how we use that. So back to this um, 3D textile. Um, we can use that to predict the permeability of this of this textile and that looks something like this so we work on a unit cell so we take the smallest repeating part and and um, do the computation on that so in this case this is the the unit cell of that composite um, generate in this case voxel mesh and then we do the cfd to predict where the flow is going to to go and use that to to create um, a permeability um, which we can then feed into the uh, larger scale analysis. Or we um, can predict properties. So um, when we output the model to um, finite element, we also um, output the orientations of, the, of each voxel. So um, the orientation of the fibers and um, volume fractions. And from that, we can perform the analysis and get stiffness. Um, information. So in this case, we've got the warp and the weft direction. So essentially the X and the Y direction, and they're different in the, in the two directions. So going on to um, the actual software, um, it, it's quite a complicated piece of software. So it's written in C, C++. The core um, module is written in C++. 
um, and at the very um, minimal, you can you can actually just create a DLL and incorporate that into your um, into your software. It uses various open source packages, so it uses TetGen for mes um, meshing, um, Tiny XML for um, outputting XML files um, for saving the the models, and then various other ones for creating um, meshes of various descriptions. Um, there's an export module which links to the Open Cascade um, package for outputting um, models in various different CAD formats. And then for rendering, we use VTK. Um, and it's, it's written in such a way that we use SWIG to generate a Python interface. So most users um, wouldn't delve into the C++. They would use this Python interface layer. And then we've got a user interface which uses WX widgets, um, and that's what most people um, initially, if they download TextGen, they would they would download the user interface and use it at that level, and they can use that for um, creating fairly standard models. But as soon as they want to do something which is slightly out of the ordinary, um, then they can use this Python interface to write scripts um, and um, have much more flexibility over the textiles that they create. Um, it runs on both um, Windows and Linux. And typically, most of our users are probably Windows users, but we've got um, a sort of quite, quite a few who are running um, simulations on HPCs. And so they would build um, the core and the Python interface on the HPC and just use that. Um, maybe run optimization um, uh, uh, codes and um, then get an output of the optimum and then render it on the user interface back on their desktop. So that's the sort of um, the way that the, the thing is implemented. And um, route to open source. So TextGen started life um, way back in 1998. Um, as part of an EPSRC funded project. Um, and there was um, then a, a PhD, no, he was a, a third year project student at that, that time, Martin Sherburn, who created the second version of the project in 2002. And he then went on to do a PhD um, along with um, an, another PhD student. Um, so there were two projects, one studying textile geometry and one st studying textile composite mechanics. Because um, one of the things I forgot to say is one of the things that we do when we're modeling the textile geometry is take um, realistic images like the CT scan that you saw um, and observe how the actual textile behaves and build refinements into the model so that we create more realistic models. And that's what um, Martin Sherbin did in his PhD. And then these two PhD students. Um, when they were, I think, when they were fairly towards the end of their PhDs, managed to persuade um, their supervisors that um, releasing TextGen as an open source um, package would be was the way to go. And um, so, in 2006, when Martin Sherbin was a postdoc, he actually um, released version three of TextGen um, as open source. And I think he maintained it for about a year, and then in 2009. He left. Um, I think he went into doing games programming. Decided that was more would be more fun, and essentially the project was dormant for about a year um, while they advertised for somebody to um, to take over the project. Basically, they were advertising for um, a software engineer with a composite materials background, and there aren't an awful lot of those around. So, um, uh, so then I, I'd been made redundant from my previous job and uh, saw this post and applied. And so in 2010, I started work on, on the project. And at that time we were funded by um, a textile composites platform grant from EPSRC. And um, during that time, since then, we've, we've had various research collaborations, supported quite a lot of PhD students, and there are users all over the world. Um, and, in 2016, um, I got an EPSRC RSC fellowship, uh, Research Software Engineering Fellowship, um, the title of which is Software for Textile Modeling and Simulation. So that has kept 
the project running for about the, for the last nearly five years now, and I'll come on to that a bit more in, in a few minutes. So just a, just a bit really about how, how having the project as open source has, has affected it really. There are, there are actually two, two um, main softwares for this MISA scale modeling of textiles. Um, one is called WiseTex, which is run by um, Leuven University in, in Germany, in, not in Germany, in Belgium. Um, but they've gone down the commercial route, um, whereas TextGen is the other one, and we've obviously gone open source. And we have a, an awful lot more users than, than WiseTex. There are, they do have quite a few users, but I think it's less than 100. Whereas you can see here, um, since the launch in 2006, the, the, the number of users and downloads has, has gradually increased. So this 45,000 figure is, is um, not a total of 45,000 users because you can see these peaks and basically they correspond to new releases. So this, this total number does include people re-downloading when they've, um, when they've up, updated to a new release. And you can see that it's used by, by people all over the world, basically. Um, during the course of my fellowship, it used to be, so the executables are still available on SourceForge and it used to be ho hosted um, in an SVN repository on SourceForge. But during the course of my fellowship, I've, I've shifted over to GitHub um, with using Git. And um, basically we've, we've got quite a lot more interaction from people actually downloading the code since then. And there are also sample code and tutorials available there. Um, so advantages, so the open access, it encourages people to just basically download and, and use the, the software. Um, so that this year so far, there have been around about 80 publications using TextGen. So that, that there are quite a lot of, of people using that. And it's it's not just composites. It's basically anyone who wants to create any sort of a textile model. So you can see here, this is um, some work that we did a couple of years ago with trying to create a, a, a knitted type of textile. And here you can see where we, we specify nodes and generate paths and then create the, the cross section around that. So that's the sort of basic text gen model. And then this has had, um, this has been um, pulled essentially. So it's ten been tensioned and you can see the deformations here. So that's different sort of textile that some people are using. Um, and the fact that it's got the Python scripting means that people can generate the, the types of textiles that they want to, or they can extend the, the code if they want to dip into the C++ code and, and develop that and extend that, then they're they can obviously do that. Um, and clearly we've got simplified um, IPR issues because th the code is open. Um, and there's also an active user forum which um, gives support. It's largely me giving support on, on there. If you look on the on the TextGen forum, you'll see lots of answers by Louise PB. Um, but there are some exchange of ideas as well there. So that's another advantage. Um, and so it, it might seem a bit counterintuitive to, to release the software rather than trying to commercialize it, but it's actually brought in funding um, because we've had cases where people have downloaded the software, just taken a look at it, and then have contacted us and said, okay, can we do it a collaboration? And um, this one with Voigt Paper Fabrics was quite a long time ago now, but it's a really nice example. So Voigt, um, in Germany make these enormous paper making machines and they have this um, fabric that goes around the rollers um, for making the paper and if you look on the right here that they're, they're these quite complicated um, textiles so the large side is where it goes around the rollers and then it has this fine side which is where it actually um, has the the paper slurry put onto it um, to make the paper. So that has to be very fine to get a fine paper surface. And they wanted to simulate their, um, their fabrics because they need to know how it wears as it rolls around the, um, the rollers, but they, they also need to know how their, the, the fluid is going to flow through the material because um, obviously the, the paper slurry is, is deposited on the material, but then it, it flows through it and they need to 
and leaving the, pa the paper behind. So they need to know how the fluid flows. So in this project, um, we were able to create an add-on. So that's one of the, the nice things about the way the software is, is created. So um, a user interface was created, allowing them to create these specific type of, of fabrics. And we could supply that to them as an add-on that they can run through the main software. Um, but that's a, that's a separate part that they could um, have as the, the um, output for their investment in the research um, and then it, that was separate from the open store so it sort of works works well um, and the research councils like the fact that it's open source because it means that the research that they're funding um, is available for use and it, it's being disseminated so it, it works works very well as a model for um, Tech, um, research for um, software for research, um, but it's not all rosy. So there, there's an issue of, of software sustainability. So maintaining research software um, is difficult as the as the ecosystem changes. Um, it, it's not always straightforward, and it's not always straightforward to get funding either because you you apply for research funding to develop new things but you don't necessarily get research funding for keeping going what's already there um, and because of the way that this is built we've got these packages um, they change VTK in particular has undergone quite a lot of um, upgrades and you find that we've had to update the core software in order to keep it compatible with with the VTK and similarly, the other packages, the WX widgets, um, and then things like, you know, C++ changes, it's, that's evolved and um, probably haven't done as much as we sh should have done really to, to keep the C++ up to date, but that's, that's another thing. So um, that is an issue, um, keeping research software up to date so that um, people can carry on using it. Um, and there's a whole um, group of people who are thinking about this. So um, the Software Sustainability Institute is particularly interested in this whole area. Um, they were formed in 2010, um, funded again by EPSRC, and this is their um, sort of uh, strapline, better software, better research. So they're both um, uh, trying to um, promote open software um, because that helps with reproducibility of research and um, openness, but also good software engineering practice. So um, trying to get people to, to use version control and, and all this sort of thing, which makes the software more sustainable. Um, and in 2018, well, this is actually the second version, EPSRC, um, wrote this e-infrastructure strategy, um, which amongst other things recognises that as hardware evolves, so they, they um, invest a lot in, in hardware, big um, supercomputers, but they've also realised that they also need to invest in the people who are going to write the, the software um, in order to sustain that so that the software keeps running. And so um, this research software engineering sort of job title has evolved in, in academia um, and, and EPSC have funded these research software fellowships to maintain software um, and to keep research software as good quality and support open software. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get one of the, the first round of those in 2015. There was another one a couple of years ago and there's one happening at the moment, but they're um, trying to promote good software engineering practice, open software practice um, and software sustainability. Um, and that sort of whole sort of area that links really links into the, the open software thing. So that's about all I've got to say, really. I just acknowledge that for the last five years, um, EPSRC have been funding me with with. Um, an RSE fellowship, and that's been great. I'm due to change to um, an academic post in January, so that will be a whole new thing for me. 
um, but I will be keeping on developing TextGen and um, applying for funding to, to keep it going. So that's me done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, we we can now take some questions. Um, so if you uh, you can use the question feature on um, go to webinar, or you can raise your hand and go to webinar, and we'll open the mic to you. Or you can tweet at us on Twitter, and we will. I'll read out all those questions. Uh, actually, one from me, Louise. If that's all right. Um, do you think that? Um, all, I mean, I'll use the brush, but do you think that like all software that's used in research should be made open source? You know, do you think there's a case to be made for research councils putting more requirements into the software that research produces is open? I, I think it depends what it is. Um, clearly, if there's, I mean, I, I'm an engineer, so a lot of the um, the software that all the research projects that we work on are with industrial partners um, and um, so we, we do quite a lot of work with Rolls-Royce so clearly s some of the software that's written for them is, is never going to see the light of day um, so I think there's um, there's a there's a case for making um, as much as you can open source and and it helps with the sustainability so um you know if, if you write a publication and it's saying we've used this software and we've developed the software and these the results that have been produced using this code then if people want to be able to reproduce that then if it's open source then obviously that that helps but it's i, th I think we've been cloud cuckoo land if we thought that it was that was always going to be the case but I think if it's possible, then then it is good, yeah, and should be encouraged. Got a question here. A question. No, no, it does absolutely, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I've got a question here from Terence Eden. Um, what's the most interesting or exciting thing the software has been used for? Oh. Um. Well, I think um, so. Uh, over the last few years, we've been part of a project called BAM, <laughs> which is Breakthrough Aerospace Materials, um, and that's with um, uh, partners like British Aerospace, Rolls Royce, and so that's that's developing. Um, I, I didn't put a picture of any of them up actually. Um, there are, there are projects to create much more complex weaves. So if you imagine you've got that 3D textile um, where you've got the yarns going through, if if partway through you um, you make them only go halfway through and halfway through on the other, then you end up with something with a that you can open up with a bifurcation. So you can create a T piece, and those are, are used on. Um, a lot in aerospace for, for stringers um, for strengthening um, and um, in aerospace they're they're looking to create um, uh, 3d woven fabrics which sort of uh, gradually get wider so that you can use them for fan blades and engines and, and that sort of thing so that's 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 all pretty exciting really yeah um, those are probably the most yeah Brilliant, thanks Louise. Uh, I've got a question here from Maeve Morrissey. Um, thank you Louise, this was fascinating content. My question is, what inspired you to work in software engineering after completing your PhD in a mechanical slash materials research area? Well, when you when you saw what I, I think what I forgot to say was when, when you saw that machine, off to the side there was um, a PC, it was a 286 PC, it was the most up-to-date machine computer in pc in the department um with loads of expansion boards in and i actually wrote all the software as well so it was written in 286 assembler <laughs> and um 
And during the course of that PhD, where I did both the, the software and the mechanical side, I realized that I was far better at being at writing software than I was at being a mechanical engineer. So it's sort of I've, I've sort of come full circle now and I'm actually about to become a, a lecturer back in the mechanical engineering department. But hopefully they'll keep me lecturing in software because <laughs> that's what I'm best at. So it was sort of um, it was one of those things because I didn't encounter computers until I got to university. I didn't realize that that was what was going to make me tick and that the thing that I would be good at until that until that point. Brilliant, thank you. That's all the questions. Thank you very much.